dinosaurs. What are they? I think we would all agree that that is a dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex, the most iconic of all dinosaurs. But what about a mosasaur? Is that a dinosaur, a big sea creature that lived 70 million years ago? Let's take a vote. Show me your hands. Who thinks that's a dinosaur? What about this? A flying reptile that lived in the Mesozoic. Is that a dinosaur? How about crocodiles? Who thinks they are dinosaurs? Now, what about this? A little fuzzy penguin. Who thinks that's a dinosaur? Well, before I tell you what I think, let's talk about how paleontologists define what a dinosaur is. Dinosaurs are distinct from their reptilian ancestors by their enhanced vigor and power. Dinosaurs were active creatures with an upright stance and limbs that were hinged for straight ahead motion. And to accommodate this kinetic lifestyle, dinosaurs evolved extra large muscle attachments and particularly strong hips. Now contrast this with the languid, sprawling posture of other reptiles, such as this lizard. It's true, lizards are capable of blinding bursts of speed, but they spend much of their day in torpor, always about half a push-up away from taking a nap. <laughs> so, the answers. Mosasaurs, big scary sea monsters that lived along with the dinosaurs, they do not have the requisite anatomy to be dinosaurs, and they branch off before there was the first dinosaurs not dinosaurs. Pterosaurs, like pterodactyls that you see in all of the children's books about dinosaurs, again, they do not have the definitive anatomy of dinosaurs and they branch off before there is the first dinosaurs. They're not dinosaurs. Crocodiles are the closest living relatives to dinosaurs, not dinosaurs. That little fuzzy penguin, that is a dinosaur. <laughs> now, What's that you say? How can a little fuzzy penguin be a dinosaur just like a T-Rex? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm here to tell you that common sense is a poor guide to understanding the universe. And always has been. You go out at night and you see the stars going around the Earth. You go out in the daytime and you see the sun going around the Earth. Well, that's not the way it works. The sun is at the center of the solar system. It's not common sense, but it's true. And a penguin is a dinosaur. That's not common sense, but it's also true. And I'll, I'll explain why. When we define dinosaurs, we know them mostly from their fossil skeletons. So the definition of a dinosaur is based on their skeletal anatomy. And we can use that definition to define what the first dinosaur is that occurs in the fossil record. And then we say that a dinosaur is that species and 100% of that species descendants. That is the group dinosaurs, the family tree of the phylogeny of dinosaurs. So we take that first specimen and 100% of its descendants, and that forms what we call a clade. A clade is what we say as a monophyletic group, monophyletic meaning a single branch on the tree of life. And so if we go back to that first dinosaur 231 million years ago, well, guess what? That's not very long ago. That's only about 5% of Earth history ago, which sounds remarkable. But if we take the entire history of the Earth and we crunch it down to a single calendar year, four and a half billion years, down to a year with the Earth starting on January 1st, we don't get life on Earth until March of this year. We don't get multicellular life, like jellyfish, until the summer. The fossil record doesn't get good until hard-bodied life evolves in the Cambrian half a billion years ago. That's the end of November on this calendar. All this time, there's no life on land. Life finally invades land in the first week of December. And dinosaurs 231 million years ago? That's the second week of December on this calendar. Dinosaurs dominate the continents for 165 million years until they all go extinct except for the birds. That's Christmas Eve on this calendar. Our ancestors, like Australopithecus Lucy, well, they show up on December 31st at 3.30 in the afternoon. And our species, Homo sapiens, 200,000 years ago, that's the last night of the year at 11.59 59. There's some perspective for you. So we take that ancestral dinosaur and we say 100% of its descendants make up the dinosaurs. And by analogy, we can look at a human family tree. So let's take great, great, great grandmother Polly here. And I think we would all agree that you take Polly and her children and her grandchildren and so forth, and that constitutes the Polly family. If you have Polly for an ancestor, you're in the Polly family. 
Now look down on the bottom right there, little baby Sally. What do you say we kick her out of the Polly family? Can we do that? No, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that. It would be totally arbitrary to do that. There would be no basis for doing that. So we have to take the entire family tree, and that constitutes the Polly family. Just the same way as if we look at dinosaurs, we have to take the original dinosaur and 100% of its descendants, and that constitutes the family. We can say that birds are dinosaurs because they fall into that group, but you might say, well, okay, we can see the birds evolve from dinosaurs, but should we still call them dinosaurs? I mean, at some point, shouldn't we say they stopped being dinosaurs and became just birds? Well, no. When our ancestors evolved into humans, they didn't stop being primates, did they? They were not stripped of their membership in the club of mammals. Their animalness was not revoked. They remained all of those things. A penguin is a bird and a dinosaur by virtue of the fact that it has dinosaur ancestors. And birds, like all dinosaurs, can trace back their ancestry to the very first one. So let me introduce you to another dinosaur. This is one that I found in southernmost Patagonia in Argentina. And my crew and I worked for many years to dig this animal out of the ground, Dreadnoughtus shrani. And Dreadnoughtus was 85 feet from snout to tail. It stood two and a half stories at the shoulders. And all fleshed out in life, it would have weighed 65 tons. That's the mass of 13 bull African elephants. That's the mass of nine T-Rex. That's about 10 tons heavier than a Boeing 737. So let me pose this question. Who's more closely related, Dreadnoughtus and a dinosaur like Stegosaurus, or Dreadnoughtus and a little tiny hummingbird? Well, we can look at the phylogeny, the family tree of these animals, for the answer. And it turns out that if we go back in the dinosaur family tree, we don't have to go back as far to find the common ancestor of Dreadnoughtus and a hummingbird as we do to find the common ancestor of Dreadnoughtus and Stegosaurus. So it's Dreadnoughtus and the hummingbird that are the more closely related pairs. And in fact, all of the dinosaurs on this side, the giants and the meat eaters and the birds, are all more closely related to one another than they are to any of the dinosaurs on the other side. Let's take a look at the plasticity of this group. And you can see here, I'm laying next to the femur of Dreadnoughtus. That's two meters long. And there I'm holding the tiny skull of a ruby-throated hummingbird. Two relatively closely related species. If we look at this example, humans and coelacanths and a rainbow trout, and we can ask the same question, who's more closely related? Now, a coelacanth is a lobe fin fish, and we can look back in the phylogeny of fish, and we can see when the most recent common ancestor of humans and lobe fin fish occur versus the most recent common ancestor of coelacanths and the rainbow trout. So when we do that, what we see is that coelacanths and all limbed animals, including humans, have a more recent common ancestor with each other than a coelacanth does with a rainbow trout. So the more closely related pair here is the coelacanth and the human. And in fact, these are living animals, right? So we can get their DNA and we can sequence it and we can actually molecularly see who is more closely related. And there's a great website called Time Tree written by a friend of mine, Blair Hedges, and you can punch in the names of various animals and you can see the time of their most recent common ancestor. And when we do that for a coelacanth and a human, we can see that they diverged at 412 million years ago when you look at a coelacanth and rainbow trout, you have to go back 430 million years ago to find their common ancestor. So if we define what the fish clade is, you find the ancestral fish, the first one that occurs in the fossil record, and take 100% of its descendants, and you see who's in that group. The lobefin fish are in that group, and all the limbed animals are in that group. So we are members of many nested clades. We are humans and apes, and primates, and mammals, and reptiles, and amphibians, and fish. Each of us, a menagerie. Each of us, a walking museum of natural history. Our DNA, like the city of Rome, was built and rebuilt by countless forebears. Some known, some forgotten. A shovel full of sand, a single blow with a hammer, a passageway moved a bit to the left. Over time, the changes add up. And within each of our ancestral groups, our membership is complete. 
There are no half fish. There are no half apes. We are apes. That's pretty obvious. But we are also fish. Granted, highly derived fish, but fish nonetheless. And so are dinosaurs. During 92% of our evolutionary history, the ancestors of humans and the ancestors of dinosaurs were the same. Born of bacteria in the Archean oceans 3.8 billion years ago, our lineage is shared with dinosaurs and with all other animals throughout most of Earth history. The future existence of all backboned animals then teetered on a knife edge when our tiny, wormy, chordate ancestors managed to survive in the Cambrian seas of a half a billion years ago. The fate of all limbed animals rested on the newly evolved shoulders of these tetrapods when they emerged from the Devonian mangroves. And then, it was in the steamy forests of the Carboniferous 320 million years ago when the path of our ancestors and dinosaur ancestors finally diverged. When two distinctive reptilian groups, the sauropsids and the synapsids, emerged from our common stock, our one road through time was irrevocably torn asunder. Evolution is a one-way street. Once parted, avenues can never be rejoined. It would be another 89 million years before a single species of sauropsid would go on to produce the first dinosaurs. 21 million years later, synapsids would produce the first mammals. Like a tropical typhoon propagated from a low-pressure cell, swept into being by a single flap of a butterfly wing. The events set into motion by the sauropsid synapsid split were inconspicuous at first, but would forever change the world. These two groups would go on to conquer the Earth, the sauropsids first, until the tables were turned by an asteroid impact. Imagine what a different planet this would be if the common ancestor of dinosaurs and humans had gone extinct before the sauropsid synapsid split. There would never be dinosaurs, never mosasaurs, never penguins or any birds, never turtles, never snakes, never crocodiles. If the synapsid side fails, never whales, never rodents, never lions, never camels, never bats, never humans, never you. Throughout my career, working on various aspects of Earth history, my awe for the role of contingency in the unfolding of our planet's story has continued to grow. Perturb something here, delay an event there, reorder a single step in an obscure sequence, or shift a continent this way or that, and Earth history forevermore changes. A single sunbeam causing a single mutation is all that it takes. A space rock nudged an infinitesimal degree to the left or right could change the course of all that is yet to pass. Kill off an inconspicuous wolf-like creature on the ancient shores of Pakistan, and today, there are no whales. Shift the winds one way or another across northern Africa six million years ago, and humans evolve or do not evolve, as forests turn to grasslands or not. The contingencies are endless and mind-boggling, an infinite kaleidoscope of things and events interacting with one another in ways that we may never fully understand, everything matters. The more I contemplate the improbability of my existence, of your existence, the more gratitude I feel for being alive, for being human, and for living now in an amazing age of wondrous technology and ever-expanding understanding, an age in which we can conceive of and affect a better future for all of us and for our planet. Thank you.